And so Pastor Kurt has led us over the last couple of weeks uh, about just navigating the life of the prodigal son. So um, we've been kind of basing this on, obviously, Jesus' story, but then Rembrandt made this beautiful picture, painted this, and just captured some of the characters of this story brilliantly. And so we've spent most of our time so far on kind of really what, what seems to be the center of the story, right? It's the father and it's the son who went away to a distant country and came back and was reunited with his father. And, and when you hear the story of the prodigal son, that's really kind of the, the story that we think of, right? It's the story of, of a son who kind of had questions. And he was like, man, I, I think I'm missing out on something. I think my father's maybe holding out on me. I need to explore someplace different. I need to go to maybe a, a place out of my home. I need to go explore something that I can just find on my own. Maybe a place that might be more fun or life-giving, but I want to leave where I'm at. I want to leave my father and I want to go to a distant country. And so the son goes and explores, and many of you know the story. We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. He, he squanders everything. He asks for half of, half of his father's possessions. The father actually gives it to him, which was crazy in, in the culture of the time. It was like, how would you do that? So the son goes, and he, and he loses everything. He just loses everything. And he, and he lives just this crazy lifestyle, loses everything. He gets to the end of himself when finally he says, what am I doing? He gets to the end of himself, and he says, even my, even my father's servants, the people that work on the farm back home, have a place where they can actually get a meal. I'm starving and I'm eating pig food. And he decides to go home and he's reunited and, and he's thinking, what am I gonna do? How am I possibly gonna ever come home? I, I will be shamed. I, I'm gonna have to work the rest of my life trying to pay off a debt. It's beyond me. I can't even pay that kind of debt. I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. And he comes home and, and one of the most beautiful lines in the story is the father runs to meet the son. The son has come home. And Rembrandt beautifully depicts this by just this embrace of the son who's lost everything. He's poor. He's got scars. He's just, he's just hurt. He's broken. And the father embraces him. Now, when you think of the story of the prodigal son, I think it would be actually fair to say that if you were to, to walk through the story and then somebody would ask you, hey, so what have you been talking about at church? I, I think you could give a rendition similar to that, right? About the prodigal son, and, and that's kind of how the story goes, right? It, it's, it's a happy ending. It's good. But it's interesting because that's kind of where we stop thinking about the story, but the story actually doesn't stop there. There's another character in the story. He's referenced earlier, but, then, but in the second half of the story, we actually kind of dive a little bit deeper into the relationship between the father and, and another son, the older son. And the older son, you just Rembrandt does this well, he's, there's, there's a pretty significant gap between the, the older son and the activity that's going on here on the side, right? So what's happening in the heart and mind of the older son? I just want to say right up at the front, the, the, the main idea of the story of the last, two, the last two weeks, but the main idea of Jesus' story, in all of the things that he teaches, and his heart is just so consistent, his heart is that the father would be able to embrace both sons. His desire, the, the father's desire, and we're, we're going to see this over and over again today, the father's desire is for this distance to go away, right? The older son has put himself outside of the equation. He's put himself, he's put distance between him and the father, and the father doesn't want that distance. So today we're going to talk a little bit, what's the journey going on, not just in the, in the, the journey that the younger son w went on, but what's happening in the heart of the older brother? What's, what's going on there? So, um, it's, it's helpful to remember the context of, and, and the significance of why the older brother is important. It's, it's, Pastor Kurt told us a couple weeks ago, there's, there's the context of why G Jesus told this story to begin with, right? So he told a, a couple stories. We'll review this in just one moment. Take a look at Luke 15. That's where the story is found. But starting back in verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners 
were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Jesus tells the story of a lost sheep, and then a lost coin, and then he tells the story of the prodigal son. So the sheep is found, the coin is found, and the younger brother is found. But there's a little bit of tension in the story because it doesn't, it doesn't fully end with this beautiful place with the older brother. And I think this is very intentional. I think Jesus tells this story very much on purpose. So what at the end of the story is the status of the older brother? So I want you to just, as, we, as, we, as you hear this, I want you to be thinking about where is the older brother at? And there's a question that I want you to consider and it's really important. I think it's important for us to consider but I think it was just as important for Jesus' original audience as he's telling the story. I think this, this question is at the heart of why Jesus tells the story. In fact, all three stories, but especially the story of the prodigal son. So here's, considering Jesus' audience, the following question is so important. How does the older brother in Jesus' story react to his brother's encounter with grace? How does the older brother in Jesus' story react to his brother's encounter with grace? Now there's this distance that is between them. How, how does that... How does that narrow? What does that look like? So this, I just want you to pay attention to that as we go through this today. So starting in verse 25, we're going to read today the second half of the story. So starting in verse 25. Meanwhile, so the son has come back, the father has embraced, kill the fatted calf, get rings, get jewelry, get robes. I want a party. They're having a party, right? So that's how the, the, the story, the first half of the story ends. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. The word for music here is the same word we get for symphony. This is like, there is a party going on, okay? So he's like out in the field working. He hears like a ways from the house still. He sees there is something happening. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. What? Why the party? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has come back safe and sound. Now, you have to get the picture of like throwing a couple burgers on the barbecue out of your mind. That's not what this is, right? This isn't like, hey, you know what? We're not sure what to do after church. Why don't you come over and have a barbecue? That's not the picture here. This is, this is we have been fattening up this calf for a year. This is like, this is in, in this culture, it's like the Day of Atonement. There's a celebration to be had, and we're, we've been preparing this animal for a feast, right? So, like, pick, like Christmas Day, right? It, it's, it's a big deal. The older brother, how does he react? The older brother became angry and refused to go into the party. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Orders is an interesting word. I've slaved for you and never disobeyed your orders. But you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, distances him completely, when this son of yours, not my brother, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him? My son, the father said, you're always always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. So... What in the world is going on here? Do you ever find yourself talking to yourself? Do you ever have a conversation with yourself? You don't need to raise your hand, it's okay. (laughs) Who doesn't talk to themselves? I'm talking to myself right now. Um, (laughs) I, I just, I have this feeling that the older brother replayed this situation in his mind countless times. Like, does this ever happen to you? You're having a conversation with somebody or, or something happens, you do something, you say something, and then a certain thing happens. Or, or sometimes even worse, somebody else does or say something and a certain thing happens and then you go back later and you, th- you think that whole thing through and again, you're like, 
man, I'd, I'd say this different, or they should have said this different, or, or, or whatever. So this whole self-talk is happening. And I just think we're going to see a whole lot of self-talk that gets like a volcano erupting that comes out in a moment. But I, I, my guess is, is that it, in this story, the older brother had, had done some self-talk and had played out this whole scenario multiple times. And I think the, how it played out in his mind, if he was to do it again, I think he would be like, okay, Father, I'm going to coach you here. This is, this is the appropriate response to, I want half of your possessions so that I can run and go live on my own and waste everything and shame our family. Here's how it's supposed to go. No, you don't get any property, and you're no longer actually part of this family. I think we're going to just excommunicate you. I think that's probably, and legit, in this culture, I really think that's probably where the older brother is processing things. That's far more realistic than the father in this culture giving the son the inheritance. So I think the older brother is like, no, 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 no. This didn't go how it should have went, and I think he replayed it. So the older brother seems a little less excited when the brother returns and a huge party, the fattened calf, is thrown in his honor. In his honor, what? Now just as the younger brother, or pardon me, just as the younger well, brother, the son, has a journey to the distant country, and we've walked through that brilliantly, I might say, in the last couple of weeks, and we've walked through this journey and we see the younger brother, we see the distance, and the distance gets further, the more, the more very identifiable sins the younger brother engages in. Does that make sense? So, so the young, younger brother says, first of all, I want all of your stuff, and kind of, I wish you were dead. Okay. So he takes all the stuff, but then he goes and squanders it all. And he wastes it on, on just crazy living. The kind of living that I think everybody in the room would agree is just out of bounds. Okay. But the sins of the younger brother are very, like, visible. They're very in your face. But it doesn't mean that the older brother also didn't go on a journey. He didn't go to a distant country, but he distanced himself from the father. In this story, the one who was far away is now close. The one who was close is now far away. What happened? The journey that the older brother went on, I think, had to do with resentment. It had to do with, with comparing himself and his relationship with his father through the lens of his relationship with his brother. And it led to complaint. And there is this dangerous journey that can happen when we're close to the father. We can create distance when we fall in and when we walk the same journey, the same path that the older brother walked. And friends, it just seems to me that it is so easy. It is way more subtle, but it is so easy. It might even be easier than the distant journey to go on our own journey of resentment and comparison and complaint. So we're going to talk just for a few minutes about what does it look like, what happened, and, and how do we, do, do, do we have anything to, to go on here? What, what happens? What, what, how are... How are people hearing the story from Jesus, and how do we hear this? So, first thing I want to just recognize is when grace is extended, unspoken resentment rises to the surface. When grace is extended to the younger brother, that's what triggers it for the older brother. He's been doing self-talk for a long time. Now, it was getting worse. It was slowly boiling, right? right? It, was, it was underneath the surface. And then grace is extended, and it just erupts. Where does this resentment come from? Where does the older brother, where, like, where does it, like, what happened? Now, sometimes I think resentment happens through the context of jealousy. So it, it, it's possible that the, young, that the older brother was, was simply like, man, I wish I would have went. This is the result. I wish I would have went and had all the fun, right? And, and, and for some older brothers, I think that's what it is. I don't think that's the case in this situation. I think in this situation, we've got the older brother resenting the younger brother for the amount of grace that was extended to him. And specifically the fact that he didn't have to work for it. He had been working his whole life. And it just, it wasn't being recognized. Why was it not being recognized? And here this guy comes along after what kind of lifestyle? 
and he gets, and I get. So grace is an interesting thing. When someone you know receives a gift or a bonus and you don't, we have choices in that situation, right? We can celebrate with them or we can, we can resent it. And I'm not saying that means you're the worst person in the world, but just stay with me for a minute. In that moment, we have a choice. We can say, man, I want to celebrate something good that happened to you. You received a, a piece of grace. It's beautiful. But there's something in your heart, at least there's something in my heart, that sometimes doesn't always go there. Sometimes instead I'm like, man, I, I kind of resent that a little bit. Why didn't I get so-and-so? In his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, Henry Nouwen describes his experience reflecting on, on life as the younger son and what, it's, what it looked like and how, it, how he resonated with that experience of, of looking at this story through the lens of the younger son. And then he also goes through the, the, his own journey of what it looks like. He had a friend of his just basically boldly say to him, I actually think you more represent or resemble the older son. Okay, so he kind of parked in that for a little while and, and for years spent some time kind of just like navigating what does it look like to look, like, look through the filter of this story through the older son. <clears throat> His words are fascinating, and I just I want to say, I'll, I could say this every, every line, but I won't. I am so talking to myself. So if this comes across in any kind of a condemning way, that is not my point. My point today is to say, how do we move from here to here? Because some of us sometimes get stuck. So some of Nouwen's words are, are, are pretty powerful. So let me just, let me read it. It's his fault, not mine. The lostness of the elder son, however, as he compares the two situations, the lostness of the elder son, however, is much harder to identify. After all, he did all the right things. He was obedient, dutiful, law-abiding, and hard-working. People respected him, admired him, praised him, and likely considered him a model son. He continues, outwardly, the elder son was faultless. But when confronted by his father's joy and the return of the younger brother, a dark power erupts in him and boils to the surface. Suddenly there becomes glaringly visible a resentful, proud, unkind, selfish person, one that had been re remained hidden, even though it had been growing stronger and more powerful over the years. Oh. This is not a small thing. This is a journey away from the Father. He continues, looking deeply into myself. Now he just gets honest here looking deeply into myself and then around me at the lives of other people, I wonder what does more damage, lust or resentment? Oh. There is so much resentment among the just and righteous. There is so much judgment, condemnation, and prejudice among the saints. There is so much frozen anger around among the people who are so concerned about avoiding sin. Holy smokes. The lostness of the resentful saint is so hard to reach precisely because it is so closely wedded to the desire to be good and virtuous. So there's this thing in the older brother is like, man, I, 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 I pronounce, I live a life of duty. I live a life of, of hard work. I do the things, man, I'm gonna pull up my bootstraps. That's just the way I'm gonna live. But in that, there was distance that was created. His identity was no longer right next to his father. His identity started to actually shift to the things that he was about. It was his activity. It was his duty. It was his performance. To a point where all of those things, anybody that was no longer doing those things like he was doing those things, the resentment came in and it just started to grow. And it started to corrupt his heart. And his heart grew cold. Now, Nouwen's observations are similar to Jesus' experience with the Pharisees, right? The journey of the older brother is so significant to those listening to Jesus' story. The older brother worked hard and his heart was growing cold. Our degree of religious activity, or for the older son, the activity of, of serving his father, does not determine our level of intimacy with the father. 
So when the older brother shot back at his father, so the father comes out to meet to greet him. He's like, hey, hey, come into the party. He shoots back. Look, all of these years I've, I've been slaving away for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property and with prostitutes comes home, you, fill the catted, you kill the fatted calf for him. So this resentment moves into this place of comparing his standing with the father to his son's standing with the father. Everything for the older son goes through the lens of comparing himself to his, his younger brother. His complaints are filtered through the lens of comparison. He loses sight of what he has, he loses sight of his brother, and even loses sight of his father. Now, comparison is, is a tricky thing because I think we're actually, we're trained to compare, Right? In our society, we just, we just compared ourselves to one another. My identity is often based on my perception of you in so many different ways, but it's just, it's not even something that is, that is like, we just, we just do it naturally. So if you're a, a student, you're gonna open up an Instagram account and you're like, you're, you're going strong and you're like, man, I've, been, I've had this for, for a month. I wonder, like, this is amazing. I'm really enjoying this. I've even got a couple people that are following me. This is cool. And then you, you connect with a group of friends and you're like, oh, I, I've got like three people following me. I'm like, oh yeah, I have 750 million people following me. And all of a sudden there's this, oh, wait a minute, my identity, my actual worth just changed for some reason. In fact, sometimes I think it's even hard for us to establish our identity without that comparison. How much do we make for a living? Well, it, it's not really about whether I can cover my expenses. It, it, it's really about what do I make compared to the person across the hall from me. And the, like we actually set our, our identity often based on how we compare to other people. That's just the economy of how we function in so many, so many different ways. It's just really important to say out loud that that's not God's economy. That's not the way he functions. He doesn't say, okay, well, you're all in the room and uh, you get this and that sets the standard for who gets all the blessings. That, that's how I'm gonna do it. That's thoroughly not how he does it. That's not his economy. Even Jesus tells a parable about this. The, the landowner goes and he, and, he, and he hires somebody early in the morning, right? And, and, and he says, I'm gonna give you a denarii, which is a day's worth of work, and you can work for me all day long. Great, I've got a job, this is fantastic. And then later, at, at the, later in the morning at nine o'clock, he hires somebody else. He says, hey, you can come and work for me. Okay, great. At noon, at three, and at five, he hires more people. And they're all working. And then the landlord, he says, hey, I want you to hand out the, 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 the day's wage, but start with the people who, who just started more, more recently. They've, they've worked less time. And, and they get a denarii. And they're like, wow, man, you know, I've only been here for a few hours. That was amazing. And then, what is the person who started at noon, thinking about the guy who started at five. He's like, wait, oh, yeah, I've been working five more hours. That's double. What's going on? He still gets a denarii. Then it goes all the way to the guy who, who started at bright and early when the sun gave, came up. He still gets a denarii. They're like, they're furious. They're like, what is going on? This isn't fair. Listen to what, listen to what he says, as the landowner, he, he talks to these, these employees and he says, don't I have the right to do, this is Matthew 20, verse 15, don't I have the right to do with my, what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? The economy of God is just different. And when we, when we do this comparison, when we do this, they receive this blessing, they didn't receive this blessing. That's not how God functions. I think, I think we have an example that's more like family. And it's a bit of a silly example, but I'll, I'll just give it to you because I think it just illustrates the point. Imagine it's, you're in a family, okay? And there's a new baby born into your family, okay? And the baby is born in September. And, uh, and then Christmas comes. And then imagine if you're the older brother in this situation, or sister, let's say the older sister, sorry, we've been talking a lot about men. The older sister in this situation says, um, Hey, it's Christmas time, it's time to open presents. And, and they open all the presents, and it's like, oh, this is amazing, this is fantastic. And then the older sister says, whoa, 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 whoa. This kid's only been here for three months. <laughs> they should at most get one quarter of the presents because they're contributing nothing to this family at this point. <laughs> Why would you give them 
as many presents as you gave me. So, right, it just doesn't make sense. But in a family context, and so in the same way, God thinks relationally, God thinks family, and God's intent is that we come to him directly for blessing, not through the filter of what did they get. And the older brother got lost in this. He just got lost in it. He's like, wait, whoa, 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 what? Like, the, when the father comes to him, he says, man, you, you've got everything I've got. What, what are you missing? So, another quote from Nowen. Both needed healing and forgiveness. Both needed to come home. Both needed the embrace of a forgiving father. But from the story itself, as well as from Rembrandt's painting, it is clear that the hardest conversion to go through is the conversion of the one who stayed home. See, the problem with resentment is it pulls me from the center and it pulls me from the father. The problem with comparison is it pulls me from the center and it pulls me from the father. The problem with complaint is it pulls me from the center and it pulls me from the father. So friends, what is the father's response? What is he thinking? Is he like, you know what? You spoiled. Do you know what his response is? It's exactly the same response as his response to the younger son who squandered everything and came back and he ran to find him. The father in Jesus' story pursues the older brother just like Jesus in his heart for Pharisees and teachers of the law that were judgmental and condemning other people, he pursued relationship because he loves them even in that state of running and choosing resentment instead of intimacy with the father. That's powerful. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. He pursued relationship with the older son. So how do you come back from resentment? What does this look like? And, and now one gives us a couple things, which I just think are super helpful. They've been helpful for me. Two things, just two disciplines or practices that are helpful when we're in this state and we're looking down with shame. How do we get out of there? How do we get back to intimacy with the Father? Two things that he suggests. One is trust and one is gratitude. Trust is that deep inner conviction that the Father wants me home. As long as I doubt that I am worth finding and put myself down as less loved than my younger brothers and sisters, I cannot be found. Oh, friends, this is so important. Jesus' heart, whether you are running and doing crazy sins that everybody can see, or whether your heart is subtly and very discreetly turning more and more away from him. His heart is for you. It just is. And what we need to do, what the, what the older son needed to do, is he needed to humble himself and just say, <laughs> I'm going to kneel down right beside my brother because that's where I belong. In the embrace of my father. And he simply just needed to say, I, I, I choose to trust that you want me here, not based on my performance. My, my, son ob or my brother, pardon me, obviously proved to everyone in the country that he did nothing to deserve this. But I also know that you want me here too. And even though I'm experiencing, or, or he's experiencing freedom, pardon me, let me try that again. Even though he had lived a life with his father and he was experiencing everything he, he felt like he needed, the brother goes away, and as soon as grace is extended, somehow we get it in our mind that, that we, we can't offer grace or freedom to somebody because it's going to somehow negatively impact us, as if there's a quantity limit on this. But God has enough grace for everybody. Second thing, resentment and gratitude cannot coexist. So gratitude is the second, is the second practice. Resentment and gratitude cannot coexist. The discipline of gratitude is the explicit effort to acknowledge all, that all I am and have is given to me as a gift, a gift to be celebrated with joy. When we choose to say, I am grateful and I want to count my blessings, it changes something in us. 
it, cha- it moves us from resentment and it switches us to gratitude. That's just what seems to happen. And I'm gonna just quickly, let me just, can I just be <laughs> open with you for a second? Um, for all of us, and I know I'm not unique to this, but I've got a mic, so I'm just gonna take a second. The last couple of years has been hard. And, and sometimes it's easy for resentment to come in. And you know what? Let me just say, if you're, if you're leading anything, you know what I'm talking about. It's like we as a society kind of just had a day and it lasted for two and a half years. And then there's something that just goes on in your heart and you're like, man, I just... There's resentment. And, um, and so I was driving down the road a while ago. This is, this is a number of months ago. And I, hadn't, I wasn't familiar with this song, but God gave me a, a gift of a song. If you love deep hymns, you're not going to like this song. It's, it's a song, the, the, words, the words are just like, really? It's, it's, a, it, it's a powerful song, and I love the song. So not that the author is ever going to hear this, but it, it's also a little bit like, it, it, it almost sounds trivial. My wife fast forwards most of the song when we're listening to it together. It's called A Million Little Miracles. And, and I'm driving down Crow Child and I'm, I'm, I'm driving down the road and I'm just kind of stewing in my self-talk. And, um, and this song comes up. A Million Little Miracles. Just naming blessing. Naming it, calling it out. These are the things that you need to be grateful for. My son, who I want close to me. I had to pull over. It was just a powerful moment for me, and I didn't realize at the time I hadn't read Nouns book, but I sure knew at that moment that gratitude and resentment, they just can't coexist because gratitude just pushes it away. Now, um, the story isn't finished. So the, 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 the sheep is found, the coin is found, the, the younger son is found, but what about the older son? And I think Jesus knew he wasn't finishing his story. The, the, the older son, the story finishes and he's still outside. Does he go in? There's still questions to be asked. Does the younger son turn around? Do, do things go? Do the older son and younger brother, do they come back together again? These are good questions. What's fascinating is the heart of the Father and the heart of Jesus when he says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, the man welcomes sinners and eats with them. How are they processing this as as these questions? But, But the heart of God, pardon me though, so the heart of God is for reconciliation and restoration. God is up to something. In Jesus' day, the gospel was being made available to Gentiles and those outside of the regular religious circles. God's desire is for people to come home, all people. His desire for us, whether we're an older son or a younger son, is to eventually take on the character and the heart of the Father. His desire is for us to say, would you be the kind of people, would you be the kind of church that says, you are so welcome here. When you show up at work, would you have the heart of, you are so welcome here. Yeah, but I, no, you are so welcome here. That doesn't, that doesn't stoop into resentment, but stays in that, in that ability to celebrate with people and to offer grace, and that we take on the heart of the Father. <clears throat> and God's heart in this story is to celebrate. But we had to celebrate and be glad, verse 32, because his brother, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and he is now found. Tom Wright, I just have one final quote here and then I'll wrap up. How, does, how, do we, how can we celebrate the party of God's love in such a way as to welcome not only the young brothers and sisters who have come back from the dead, but also the older brothers and sisters who thought there was nothing wrong with them in the first place? Oh, how do we be those kind of people that we take on the character and the heart of the Father? Hmm. Can I pray for us? Uh, God, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you have the heart of a father, that you bless, that you bring us into just a place of intimacy with you. And, um, and God, I pray for anybody here that is processing what it's like to just wa- be distant from you. 
whether it's through the lens of a younger or older brother, God, I just pray that you would draw them with your spirit close to you and to your heart. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you.